I do welcome all of you that have chosen to be on tonight, and particularly when we have, well, all our presenters, oh my God, am I grateful, but uh, having the Heart Association, uh, Soul Association, as deeply as I do with Martha Creek, I, I'm always so profoundly grateful for her presence, and it is a presence. It is an energy and presence that she brings wherever she flows, wherever she goes. She glows wherever she flows, wherever she goes. She glows in that <laughs> presence and in that light that she brings. Reverend Dr. Martha Creek is a teacher of teachers. She is a coach to all those that are in service and in ministry in many different ways and forms, but that she's there for them as a heart centering reminder of inquiry of what we're here for and what they're here for. And, and that's the most important question we can have. You know, my, my journey now, what now, what do I want to be? What do I want to feel? And go deep into that. And she's a master at inquiry. She's a master at putting questions out to you. And I can tell you this, and then the, I think this will be, be a, a few weeks back, I had a moment that kind of crashed me a little bit. It was like, God, I, I really want to connect with Martha and just be able to verbalize what I'm feeling. Well, she was on that cruise. And so it wasn't going to happen. But she sent the most profound, simple prayer, focus, centering reminder. And I can tell you that I took it in and it was cleared. I no longer had the sense of urgency that I needed to connect with anyone. It's like, oh, my God. Thank you, Martha. I've got it. I'm okay now. And so remember what you energize maximizes. And when I was in that moment, I was energizing a sense of, of sadness and, and uh, challenge. And she enabled me to minimize and in a genuine, authentic way that I could let it go. So if that doesn't say enough for an introduction to this beautiful, phenomenal, spiritual teacher and mystic and wisdom that she is. Ladies and gentlemen, my beloved Martha Creek. Thank you, Charles, so very much. It means the world that you, that I would even come to your mind at a time like that. And it absolutely is a fulfillment of my mission, which is to serve those who serve. And to be that voice, that presence, that energy, that vibration, that whatever it is, that somebody, and that used to be my most re regular prayer, is that people be healed, healed deeply, healed at depth in my presence. So that has that informs my actions, that informs my writing, what I put out, of uh, what I lead what I teach, what I apply. And this tonight and this September to remember brings us right back to um, the care we have, I think, for our own spirit, the care for our own soul. And some things come to mind in your living example of it, Charles, that my teacher told me decades ago now, decades ago, that when I ask her, like, when is enough enough? When is enough reading? When is enough workshops? When is enough programs? When is it enough? And she said, oh, honey, as long as you've got a pulse, your work is not done. So if you check to see if you've got a pulse and if you have a pulse, you've still got some work to do. And it's true. And how to be in the work for me um, without the drudgery with the acceptance that we are a work in progress, that we are a soul evolving 
and that our soul, our spirit is fine, always has been, <laughs> always will be. And here in the flesh and here in our emotional states and here in our relational dynamics and emotional dynamics, it don't feel fine sometimes. And that there's none of us here, regardless of how studied we are, how old we are, how much workshopped we are. We are not immune from a human condition of despair, of sadness, of irritation, of frustration. And people ask about how the trip was. And I said the trip was similar to how life is. Moments of bliss, moments of awe, moments of just knock my socks off and moments of irritations and frustrations. And oh my friggin' goodness, how many weather conditions can we have to derail us? How many ports are we going to have to miss? I got to the airport with this um, roundabout way after the ship couldn't land, the ship couldn't dock. And this, we navigated around and got off that ship to make this flight. And I was so proud of myself that I'd done it. And I was all peacock. I had my peacock feathers out. Like, woo, woo, woo. We did it. We did it. We did it. And got to the airport. And <clears throat> she said, you don't have a reservation. And I said, ma'am, a passenger never, ever needs to hear those words. And she didn't know what to say. And she said, you don't have a reservation. And I said, again, no passenger ever, ever wants to hear those words spoken to them. And she said, well, I don't know what else to tell you. And I said, well, let's see. So here's my little piece of paper that says I have a reservation. So maybe we can start with that. And she said, we can start with that. And your reservation's been changed. And I said, who changed it? And she said, your travel agency. And I said, well, will you please change it back? And she said, I cannot. And I said, what would it take for you to change it back? I cannot change it back. The travel agency owns your reservation. I cannot alter the changes they have made. So they had changed it in a, their attempts to help us because they thought because of the delay getting to the port, we weren't going to make the flight. So they rerouted us at a later time, 12 hours later. So you have a reservation. It's on another airline and it le this is noon and it leaves at midnight tonight. And then she said, and I said, okay, what is my new routing? And she said, you're going through Hong Kong. <laughs> I'm in Perth, Australia. That's the most Southern Western part of the other side of the world. <laughs> And I said, I literally laughed out loud. And I said, no, actually, what is my routing? And she said, again, you're going through Hong Kong. <laughs> so this notion of embracing self-compassion is not just a theory with me. So how in that moment... Could I have as much compassion for myself as I would have had for you if you were in a similar situation? I would have poured myself forward. I would have assured you. I would have stepped in. Let's call somebody. Let's see if we can get Princess Cruises on the phone, see if they'll change it back. And that's what I did for myself. I stepped away looked up the numbers, started making all the calls I could and asked anybody that would answer a phone, can you put my reservation back the way I had it? And the answer was no. So then self-compassion. How can I sit here for 12 hours 
what would support me in sitting here for these 12 hours if I was being compassionate to myself. And it caused me to go find a baggage storage person and ask them to store the bags that we had so we didn't have to keep up with them for 12 hours. We found a place to have a meal. I called, I kept calling to see if it was possible to change. I enjoyed the two friends that were with me. We notified people on the other end of our changes. So I did all I could do to care for myself, even in the disappointment, even in the disruption. So we know, we claim to know that we are a divine being, that there is a creator of us that we don't, Eckhart Tolle says, you actually don't have a life. You think you have a life, but the truth is life has you. And the stark difference of believing I have a life and I'm going to control it and I have a plan and I know how it's going to go. And the deep, deep contrast to life has me. I don't have a life. Life has me as me. And it's kinder when I don't oppose it. It's kinder to myself when I don't go to war with it, when I don't argue, when I don't interpret it, when I don't should on me. This is how it should have been. This is what they should have done. They should have contacted me. They should have notified me. They should have sent an email. They should have consulted me before they changed the thing. They sh it's like there's no compassion in that. So every should is an argument with reality. Every should is an argument with God. Every should is a cause of stress in me. So I refer to them as portals to hell. Should. And why? Why would they change it? Why wouldn't they consult me? Why didn't they check in? Why after all this, this beautiful trip, do we have a... And oh, the allure. Hi-ho, hi-ho, off to hell I go. Instead of let me interrupt this and align with reality. So the notions of self-compassion are rooted in all of our teachings. There's not one faith tradition at all that doesn't speak about um, compassion. We most often, though, hear about the importance of compassion for others. Loving our neighbors, showing compassion. And then the question then, the first one here tonight for us is, in honesty, how often do you apply the same depth of kindness and understanding to yourself? How often are you as quick to offer deep compassion, self-compassion and understanding to yourself? And what's the consequences of not doing that? Anybody want to speak up about it? Any observations you have or wisdom you want to share about that? The consequences of not applying self-compassion and understanding to ourselves. I'll share ever so briefly because of the council work that I'm doing with EMDR and the realization of how deep it goes when you have not genuinely, authentically worked on compassion and love and regard for yourself in the same manner that you seek to give to others and the reality that 
until we really have done that deeper compassionate work within ourselves of forgiveness, clearing the shoulds, clearing all of that. Um, our, as as uh, um, Angel, what 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 would what was her last name, Don? Howard, Angel Howard, uh, who is, uh, she's written a book called The Issues uh, Are in Your Tissues, <laughs> meaning your body tissues, and that we yep. store the kind of pain and grief and death that comes out of nowhere because we haven't given the very thing you're speaking about, compassion and love and regard to ourselves first, first ongoing first and so thank you because wow ha have i really understood that on a deeper level than i ever yeah after all this time honey like in no time like now to to get to what our, our work is what what we we thought we kind of had compassion under you know if you had asked me years ago how compassionate are you on a scale of 10 i would have said eight but I wouldn't have considered myself in that. And how compassionate I am, am I to myself? And it's a much lower number. A much lower number. Until, up until now. Up until now. So I'm studying with and leading a group, an immersion group that starts up in October. So if you want more information about it, just email me, marthacreek at gmail.com. Referencing the book of a, this expert, Dr. Kristen Neff, who wrote that this book is called Self-Compassion, The Proven Power of Being Kind to Yourself. I'm also reading a similar book, Dr. Charles, that is called The Body Keeps Score. And it's similar in that all that we have suppressed, depressed, disowned, denied is waiting for us. And the body has its way of, of inviting us back to what to those parts, those fragments and those exiles and those things that we've 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 put away. So she speaks about it then with three main components. So I'll break it out a little bit and then have us maybe to just take a few minutes and write about them. So the first one is self-kindness, which I referenced already. Self-kindness, which literally means treating ourselves with at least the same kindness and care that we would offer to someone we love. The same care equal care, at least that amount of care and kindness that we would offer to a good friend. So when we're facing difficulties or flub up or make mistakes, it's easy to fall into the trap of perfectionism, of self-criticism, harsh judgment, shaming, guilting, blaming ourselves. And that is like throwing gas on a fire that self-hate and recrimination. So this means then literally interrupting that patterning. Even with the tendency there, the inertia of that to say, I'm going to put something in place that's going to interrupt that patterning. So for me, it includes more, more practice of just putting my hand on my heart, a physical touch or my hand to my face. Like if I was offering soothing to you, I would touch you, some of you, on your face or your shoulder or your hands to offer a soothing touch, a soothing word to do that for me, with me, when these emotions come. And as I use questions for myself like, what would kind action be? What would kind action look like for me? And it's something very different. Because the old way for me is plow through. Pull yourself up by the bootstraps. Dust yourself off. Have your moment of wailing. And get on with it. 
So it is then slowing down, caring for that part, actually seeing it, kinder voice, kinder action. It may mean separating myself, taking a moment for silence or a prayer. It may mean um, assuring myself that this was this was upsetting, of course, and I'm okay. I'm okay. We're okay. All the parts of us are okay. We're together in this. So think about then self-kindness for me has also been um, taking uh, more rest. Actually um, blocking off time that's not scheduled from someone that's 100% scheduled and looking for extending my schedule, how to put one more thing in there. So how to give some space that's unscheduled space. Self-compassion for me has also been going from eating two slices of bread to one slice of bread. Because the truth is one was enough. And I'd never considered it that one was actually enough because I'm in such a habit of having two. Small, giant changes. I'm with my family today. I took my brother in for two specialist um, doctors today from a kidney cancer he had in May. He had a scope in his bladder. And then I went to have lunch with Hadlin, age eight, and that I hadn't seen in over a month. And then some banking. I went to the store and bought snacks and stocked up the school classrooms with snacks. Got home, made insurance calls, paid bills for them. And then I excused myself and went into a bedroom to be quiet. Does that sound easy? That's very unlike Martha, who would have sucked it up, pushed through. So think about then, let's just pause and think about in the in the life you're in, in the house you live in, in the world you exist in. What is a thing or two you could do that would lean you toward self-compassion? What are a couple of things you could do tonight, today, tomorrow that would be an, ex an extension of self-compassion to yourself? Something you would offer to a friend if they were tired or exhausted or suffering or anxious. And the second area of this is remembering. So this came to mind, Dr. Charles, as you ask about this, the September to remember. For me, remembering our common humanity. Recognizing that suffering is part of the shared human experience. Accepting that suffering is part of our human learning processes. Instead of we shouldn't suffer, there shouldn't be any suffering. I've got to end suffering. That's what I used to say. It's what I said. I worked with Byron Katie for years. Now my, my mission is to end suffering in the world. The naivete, the innocence of it, and the naivete of it. And it's still a heart's desire. Instead of allowing, accepting that suffering is included in the human journey. There's no one alive in the flesh that will not experience suffering at multiple levels. Emotional levels, physical levels, financial levels, spiritual levels, dark nights of the soul. 
And that recognizing then that that suffering is a part of our heart shared human experience and that in those sufferings, we're likely going to feel isolated in our struggles. We'll feel like w- that we're the only one that's ever had to deal with this, or we'll feel like I'm the only one that had a big reaction to having to fly through Hong Kong instead of I'm not the only one. This My response was actually a common response. My reaction was a predictable human reaction. And the author wrote in the book that when she would feel like she had been a failure to her child, which is an autistic child, a child with autism, that she would think what a horrible mother she is, what a failure she is. And remembering the common humanity that she imagined she can guess that most mothers have felt the same way. Somewhere over the course of raising children, autistic or otherwise, there's no mother alive that's not doubted her capacities. And just remembering that can lift it off of us, can can ease it for us some, our common humanity. And acknowledging our common humanity helps us to see that we're actually not alone. And my question around that sometimes is, how do others get through this, things like this? When others experience things like I'm experiencing, how do they cope with it? What does what does what do others do that I could be informed by? Including, like Dr. Charles demonstrated, reaching out to somebody. Like when I'm feeling alone, I'm actually not alone. And I don't have to keep that feeling going. I can actually reach out to somebody to have a connection with them. And the same teacher I referenced early said that told me, honey, as long as you've got a pulse, your work is not done. Said there's only three things I know for sure, Martha. And that is you do not have to do this alone. And the tendency is this is all mine. I got to sort through this myself. So I don't have to do it alone. See if you can say that out loud. You're all on mute. I do not have to do this alone. I don't have to do this alone. The second thing was, I can't do it wrong. See if you can say that. I cannot do it wrong. If you believe in these teachings, if you believe in these teachings that there's a power greater than us, that there is a creator of the universe, that there is one power and one presence in all the universe and we're one with it, that we are not separate from that, then we don't have the power to do it wrong. It will look like it's wrong and the world will, some of the people in the world will quickly point out how wrong it is. And that doesn't make it wrong. So I don't have to do it alone. I cannot do it wrong. And it'll take longer than I like. (laughs) You're welcome. It'll take longer than I like. Because we're in a hurry for overnight enlightenment, aren't we? Like if I can get one more class in, if I can get that one more workshop, one more immersive process, I am bound to transform myself so that I'm free of the human suffering and free of emotional dynamics and free of reactivity instead of how can I be in the humanness with greater acceptance? Less hate in myself, less judgment to myself, less harshness about myself. And then third, which we're practiced in, is mindfulness. And it's described, though, as being present with 
all of our emotions, not just the positive ones, all emotions being present to all of our experiences without judgment. So let it be. They're all included. And how many decades we have spent trying to get positive. And the more we try to get positive, the more we're bound in everything we've called negative. So how do you react when you believe you're having a negative emotion and you don't want to have it? How do you react? Just shut it down. And what then after you attempt to shut it down, what happens? It gets stuck inside. Say it again. It gets stuck inside and I just keep feeling it. And then it bubbles up until it explodes. Just what I meant. Mm -hmm. The very thing we're avoiding that we don't want to experience is what we're stuck in. What's stuck in us. So hopefully if you take nothing away from tonight, but that. Like all emotions are included. All experiences are included. And I'm going to do my utmost best to not suppress, depress, disown, and deny that they're there. So Dr. David Hawkins says it as swing wide the door. Swing wide the door. And it's what makes possible for them to pass instead of get stuck. So mindfulness allows us to observe our thoughts, observe our feelings with a greater sense of openness, a greater sense of compassion, a greater sense of curiosity as a superpower. Like I had a big reaction to that. Like, what was that about? Instead of what's wrong with you? Why'd you have such a big reaction to that? Instead of no, really, like I had a big reaction to that. What, what was going on with me? So true curiosity, true compassion. And to the degree that I can meet the feelings, then I'm not going to be as likely to be overwhelmed by them. Or I'm not going to stockpile them. Also, I was, I use, I, I tease that Richard Rohr and Jesus are my boyfriends and I'm in a, I'm in a little threesome with them. And I was remembering like a scripture uh, from when I was a kid and my family didn't go to church, by the way, I wanted to go to church and I told my mom, Hey, I want to go to church. And she said, which is just like Virginia Creek wisdom. You want to go to church? You find you a way to go to church. So I called up the neighbors and said, do, do y'all go to church? And I want to go to church. And I went to church with them. And one of the verses, the commandments, that's what I learned as, as a kid was the 23rd Psalm. And my Sunday school teacher would have me to memorize certain scriptures and things. And the one about loving your neighbor. Do y'all remember that one? Love your neighbor. Remember the next part? As yourself. Yep. So Byron Katie used to say, that's all, all there is. If I love you, if I love me, I love you. If I hate me, then I hate you. If I judge me, then I judge you. So imagine taking that to heart, that the commandment, is actually extending love to ourself. As Dr. Charles said, self-forgiveness, making amends to myself. I 
I want to also talk tonight a little bit about the myths of self-compassion because I was really struck by this and I've, I've spoken now on it two or three times already in just the last month or two, including me. Some people I serve also think that being kind to ourselves means self-indulgent, selfish. Can you relate to that? Like if I show self-compassion, if I said, I'm going to excuse myself now, go take some quiet. It's like, what's wrong with her? How selfish. You know, you're going to go be by yourself when you could be with us. Or that we're shirking responsibilities. So the myth is that self-compassion is self-indulgent. That it's selfish, self-centered. So that myth, if that myth is not debunked, then we're stuck in that. Versus What's the opposite of self-indulgent? What's the opposite of self-indulgent? There's no right answer, by the way. Just say whatever comes to mind. Denial. Yeah. And that's what's truer. Mm-hmm. Like to withhold self-compassion denies my spiritual self-care. My fear of seeing as selfish or self-indulgent will cause me, cause me to not offer spiritual care to myself or physical care in some cases, emotional care. So who would you be, starting right now tonight, who would you be if you were free of believing that self-compassion was selfish? If you didn't believe that a speck of that anymore, what would that be like? Freeing, very freeing. Yes. That's why we're here, I believe dawn you get a sense of that freedom in your body that i'm free of that myth i'm free of that patterning i'm freer of that notion that self-compassion is selfish versus self-compassion is very high and holy indeed maybe the greatest spiritual responsibility I have. The care of my own spirit. That's a journey I've been on this last year, mm -hmm. to be very honest. I take a nap when I feel I mm -hmm. need to. Um, it's It's been a journey. Take, take a break, walk outside, take some deep breaths, just... Absolutely, honey. And God bless you for it. And it's no little thing. And me too. That's what I was alluding to at the beginning of this, that it was like doing that on purpose. Like doing that as an act of self-care. Mm -hmm. Like yeah. I've got, to, I'm being irresponsible to myself not to do it. And, it, and it that's what it takes a lot to, oh, sorry. Yeah. It takes a lot to get to that. Absolutely, it does, honey. Absolutely, it does. So carry on at God's feet. And all of you, I saw some of us nodding. So maybe naps is where we all start. Yeah. <laughs> a, 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 nap on, a nap on purpose. Yeah. Now then think about freedom when somebody says, hey, did I wake you up? And you go, oh, no, no, I would not ever take a nap. Uh. <laughs> yes, you woke me up. I was in the middle of my self-care. I was in, in the middle of my afternoon nap. I highly recommend it. It's like, oh my God, I've got too much to do. It's like, that's more the reason to take a nap. Double your nap time when you think you've got too much to do. 
like they say about meditation, like I don't have time to meditate 10 minutes. It's like, if you don't have time to meditate 10 minutes, take 30 minutes of meditation. Mm -hmm. Myth two is believing that self-compassion is self-pity. Debbie, go ahead, honey, your hands up. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I believe that part of this um, taking care of ourselves is also a way we, I look at it as a way to stay in contact with spirit. Absolutely. If I'm not in touch with me, then I'm not, I'm definitely not in touch with spirit. And I believe that's the way I want to live my life. So I. That's it in a nutshell. Okay. Like if I'm not caring for myself, if I'm not caring for my spirit, then I'm not in touch with whatever created me. I'm in, the, I'm in a robotic motion in the patterning mm -hmm. and they're trying to keep a persona alive and wondering why we're stressed. Yeah. Beautifully said, honey. So that self-compassion is self-pity. It's often mistaken for self-pity and they're fundamentally different. Self-pity involves wallowing in problems, feeling sorry for ourselves, while self-compassion involves recognizing our pain and responding to that pain with kindness and understanding. Very different. I'll see if I can repeat it. Self-compassion is often mistaken for self-pity and it's fundamentally different. Self-pity in includes the wallowing in the problem, the feeling sorry for ourselves, while self-compassion involves recognizing our pain, honoring the pain, and extending compassion kindness and understanding to the part that is in pain. And go Susan. Mm -hmm. uh, I just wanted to say that um, I don't know how this comes to other people, but how it came to me is when I turned 80 and um, I had decided to take a trip around the world to celebrate my birthday. And I did, and it was wonderful. And I came home and I was just like on top of the world. And then all of a sudden, after I was home for a little while, I just fell into a depression and I couldn't figure what the heck is going on with me now. I mean, I was on top of the world, you know, where is this coming from? And fortunately, I had gotten a book before I went on my trip that a group at church was doing, but I didn't get a chance because they did it while I was away. And it was called Finding Yourself in Transition. I got the book out and I started reading that. And I said, oh my gosh, that's what's happening. And I, I read through the book. And then after I read all the way through it, I went back and started again. And I read chapter by chapter. And every, after each chapter, I wrote down what I was thinking and feeling. And yeah. Yeah. I guess what you're talking about tonight is making me think about that is the fact that you know, I grew up thinking that I was supposed to be the nurturer. I was supposed to take care of other people. I was supposed to be kind, compassionate to other people. And, and pretty much I was. But I left my, like you're talking tonight, I left myself yes. out in the vision. I said, wait a minute, what about me? And what, what I know now, it's taken me a long time to learn this, but what you're talking about tonight is I can't really be there for somebody else if I'm not taking care of myself. Because then yes. I have an ulterior motive. I want their thanks and their gratitude and all this. Yep. No, if I'm taking care of myself, I give out of my compassion, the love in my heart. And I have it to give because I've already filled myself. So, yes, uh, which is the true meaning yeah, of yeah. unconditional, where we wouldn't be keeping score, and then we give and give and give and then resent them for what we gave them. Yeah. 
resent them for what we did for them because we were seeking their love, seeking appreciation, seeking acknowledgement, seeking approval and exhausting ourselves with it. Yeah, beautiful, honey. I love the book. I've used it many times. Dr. Robert Brummett has been a, a teacher for many years. And one of my primary takeaways from that book was our discomfort with the void. Oh my like gosh. When our, <laughs> like I, I, when, the, and Dr. The, Dr. The Charles referred to it at the opening. Wow. Like Big Sky, 48 years of who wow. I am, a founder of that, and now it is closed, and I don't know yet what's next. And it's that, like, that's, that's enough for my skin to crawl off. To me, it was that, one that, of the okay. worst parts, because I realized I didn't want to close this door until I could see what was behind the next door. I knew there was right. another door, but I didn't, yeah. want to, I didn't want to close it. And you know what? You have to, you have to close that other door before the other one's going to open for you. It, and you're, it's like, I, I picture, you know, that I've heard people say about standing up on the mountaintop and being ready to jump and being afraid to jump. And that's the kind of feeling that I had then. It was like, oh, this is awful. It, it's, it's, it's so true, honey. And the fact that just because it was wonderful, and a part of me wants to keep it going or wants to go back to it. To let that be too. Like the grief of that, the grief of the loss, the grief of the change. To allow that to be there. And then in some cases with me, just because, and it was wonderful. Certain things were wonderful. And I don't want to go back to it. And I was the last to know. It's like, oh my God, how could I have loved that that much? And I wouldn't, I don't want to go back to it. It's like, there's something else. And I know that there's something else. And I may not even know what this something else is, but I know that that is complete. And li life shows me that. Yeah. Thank you, honey. The third one is that the, uh, the third myth, which is the final one, is that self-compassion will make me weak or unmotivated that it will make me lazy. And see, in my house growing up, the worst thing anybody could be is lazy. So I heard my mother rake people over the coals routinely about how lazy they are. And second on the list of awful was liars. Lazy and liars. They're lazy and they're a liar. So I you as a little kid I must never be that because I could would not be safe in that so talk about a formula for overworking and over functioning and workaholism anything to avoid being seen as lazy so it's not what self-compassion is in reality self-compassion provides the emotional support needed to face whatever life brings, challenges, difficulties, to face that and to do so with constructive action. What would make sense here? So it's not passive. It's not like I'm not going to do nothing. I'm not going to be lazy or weak here. It's going to prepare me to take constructive action based on what would be sane and sensible to do in a situation. And as Susan, you said beautifully, Dawn, like I'm not going to leave myself out of it. Out of my, what action am I going to do here? I'm not going to let that, I'm not going to leave myself out. So practicing self-kindness when I make a mistake or face a challenge, take moments to speak kindly to myself, to assure myself, to lift myself up to encourage me like I would encourage someone else, to support me like I would a friend, like I would you if you called me, to embrace our common humanity when we feel overwhelmed or disappointed, to reach out to somebody, to reach out to somebody. We do not have to do it alone. And then to continue to cultivate our mindfulness, to spend time in prayer and meditation, 
meditation, contemplation, surrender, purification, so that we can allow ourselves to be more fully present to everything we are experiencing. So the opposite of depressing, suppressing, disowning, denying. All right, we've got three minutes. Comments, questions, any way I can support you. You have. <laughs> Your presentation has. And, and uh, uh, you know, you, you, you've given me something to, to think so kinder and lighter on about. I call it emotional quicksand when we get caught in our judgments and the whys and if onlys and and we're we're in a quandary and that it just keeps getting deeper 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 emotional quicksand and i loved that mantra that you you offered us hi ho hi ho it's off to hell i go hi ho hi ho hi ho hi ho it's off to hell i go no i don't want that to be my spiritual mantra Absolutely not. And, you know, I usually say right on the heels of hi ho, hi ho, off to hell I go. I've checked myself into hell hotel. The good news is I have the key and I can check myself out. I can check myself yeah. out of hell hotel again yeah. and again and again. And, and we can step back. Put your hand on your heart. Take a deep breath and value the God life that you are, that we are, because we are God as who we are. There's no question. And what you brought tonight, beloved Martha, is reminding us tender, loving care, first of all, for ourselves. And therefore, we can be more authentic and free to be giving genuinely to others without anything other than loving, loving, loving. I yeah. love you, Martha Creek. Yeah. Thank you. I love, I love you too. Each and every one of you, Godspeed. I know who you are. I know what you are. I know how you serve. And I mm -hmm. am delighted to be any part of your journey. I love my heart string with you. Mm -hmm. Till we meet again. Thank you. MarthaCreek.com if I can support you. Blessings.